Jensen made some proclamations to explain the high prices of his GPUs, and last time we reviewed his proclamation that Moore's Law is dead and found that he was wrong. In this video, we'll look at his proclamation that the price of wafers is a ton more expensive, and to see if it really is all TSMC's fault. Let's get into it. In my last video, we looked at NVIDIA's portfolio of gaming GPUs for the past decade and the die sizes needed to fulfill all gaming GPUs from a 60 series up to the high-end 90 series. The chart clearly showed NVIDIA's strategy of using three die sizes, of which I simply labeled as small, medium, and large. Don't fall into the trap of naming conventions. They will only confuse, and wafer costs do not depend on the name of the die. The chart will show how the die sizes have not changed dramatically from Ampere to Ada. And with Ampere, the die were from Samsung, and with Ada, the die are from TSMC. Jensen claimed that the wafers are now a ton more expensive in Ada, which is from TSMC. So the implication is that it's all TSMC's fault for the increases in GPU prices. But is there a way to check that assertion? To get the approximate die cost, you will need to understand three things. What is the die size? How much does a wafer cost? And what is the yield? For the die sizes, we can estimate them since we do know all of the die areas for each GPU. And we can estimate the sizes based on simple squares. It won't be exact, but it will be close enough. The next is wafer cost. This is not an easy one. However, I did find a reference for an estimated wafer cost for the TSMC's five nanometer process. And that cost estimate was for $17,000 for one wafer. In doing research, there are many expert opinions stating that that value is too high for 2022 since that was an estimate for 2020 and the cost per wafer surely has come down now in 2022. However, since Ada is manufactured using the four nanometer node, which is a refined version of five nanometers, this cost would represent the worst case wafer cost for a TSMC four nanometer wafer. Now the cost of the Samsung 8 nanometer wafer was rumored to be half of TSMC's 7 nanometer wafer. In that table, it showed TSMC's 7 nanometer wafer cost at about $9,300. Using half of that cost would place Samsung 8 nanometer wafer at just under $4,700. Now, again, some experts place the cost of the Samsung wafer much higher than that estimate. Since I'm not able to find a definitive answer on wafer cost, I'm going to focus on what is the worst case cost difference between Samsung and TSMC. If I take the lowest cost estimate for the Samsung wafer and then take the most expensive cost for the TSMC wafer, then I will get the largest cost difference between these two. And I'm going to call that difference the TSMC ton. I will then add that TSMC ton to the RTX 3000 series of GPUs to determine what is the worst case cost increase due to the change from Samsung in last generation to TSMC this generation. We can then compare that price with the TSMC ton versus the new GPU prices from Jensen to see if that justifies the cost increase. And to find out if TSMC is really to blame, with the wafer cost out of the way, now let's calculate the die cost for both Samsung and TSMC. Since we know the area of the die, we can use one of the available die per wafer estimator tools online to calculate how many die you can expect to get from a 300 millimeter wafer. Starting with the Ampere large die, which has a die size of 628 millimeter squared, you get 89 die per wafer. So the die cost would be the wafer cost divided by the number of die, and at about $4,700 per wafer divided by 89 die, it's about $52 per die. Of course, that assumes all 89 die are functional, which would be 100% yield, but no fab operates at 100% yield. You always have some defects in the wafer, shown as the red dots. Those defects will render a certain percentage of the die non-functional. If we look at this table where I've calculated the cost at 100% yield down to 50% yield, you can see that at 50% yield, you would have only 44 dies functional. So the cost of the die would increase from $52 to $106. Now we don't know the exact yield rates either. However, we do know that no process operates at 100% and a process at 50% yield is not gonna stay in business very long. So for this study, we will pick a yield rate of 70%. At 70% yield, you would get 62 functional die. So with a wafer cost of just under $4,700, the cost per die would be $75.
Next, we can take the Ada Large die at 608 millimeters squared, and using the die per wafer estimator tool, we see that it would also have 89 dies per wafer, the same. Using the same yield rate of 70%, you would get 62 functional die. Now the Ada die is from the ton more expensive TSMC wafer at $17,000. That means the cost is now a whopping $274 per die. That's an increase of almost $200. I repeated this process for the medium die and the small die. And the result is that we now have a worst case cost increase for the small, medium, and large die. We now have our TSMC ton. Now if Jensen just took the increases in die cost from TSMC and passed that TSMC ton directly to the customer in the GPU price, how much would the GPU price have increased? For our base price, I could use MSRP for the RTX 3000 series for the small, medium, and large die GPUs, but prices are not back to MSRP. If I look at Newegg today and look for the large die GPU in the 3080 with 12 gigabytes, you can pick one up for about $800. A medium sized die GPU in the 3070 is anywhere from $550 to $630, so let's say $600. And a small size GPU in the 3060 is still nowhere to be seen at its $329 MSRP. They go anywhere from $370 to $460, let's say $400. The pricing looks very familiar. After the start of the GPU apocalypse in February, I followed that up three months later in May with what I saw at the time as a disturbing price trend where the prices were flattening out and not dropping back to MSRP. And in that video, I showed where you could see the new MSRP being set as $400 for the 60 series, $600 for the 70 series, and $800 for the 80 series. And that's the current price for the small, medium, and large die for the RTX 3000 series. And five months later, you see that leveling off of the GPU prices has stayed the same. This became the new normal. Yes, everyone made noise about the ridiculous over $1,000 GPU prices coming down since then, but it hasn't come down for the everyday person who just wants to buy a 60, 70, or 80 series GPU. So starting with the small die GPU in the RTX 3060 and adding the TSMC ton, we can see that if Jensen just passed on the die cost directly to gamers, the prices would go from $400 to $494. However, Jensen's price for the small die GPU is now starting at $899. That represents a $405 price increase beyond the TSMC ton. For the medium sized die GPU at the new normal price of $600 in the RTX 3070, and adding the cost increase from the TSMC ton, it would result in a $720 GPU. However, Jensen's price for the medium sized die GPU is now starting at $1199. That represents a $479 increase in price beyond the worst case TSMC die cost increase. Finally, the large die GPU in the RTX 3080 with 12 gigabytes at the new normal price of $800 with a worst case die cost increase from TSMC of $199 results in a price of $999. However, Jensen's price for the new large die GPU is starting at $1599. Now, this is not a fair comparison since the 4090 at 1599 has 24 GB of VRAM, while the 3080 comparison has 12 GB. So taking into account the removal of the cost of 12 GB of VRAM at a cost of $16 per GB, that would reduce the cost $192 and a proper comparison price of $1,407. So the price increase that Jensen has added beyond the TSMC ton is $408. For those who think the 4090 is a good deal, that is only due to the made up price on the 3090. Please go back and look at the reviews of the 3090 and how its performance compared to the 3080. It provided anywhere from a 10 to 15% increase in performance for only $800 more than the $700 MSRP price of the 3080. Yeah, more than double. The 3090 with its 24 gigabytes of VRAM is really only for professionals. No gamer needs 24 gigabytes of VRAM. But it was a huge mining GPU and I'm sure Nvidia sold more of those than they ever thought they would have. And 3dcenter.org did a price model based on the GPU's performance over a 3070 and they came to the conclusion that the 3090 should only cost $750. 
To make this point even clearer, I took the TimeSpy Extreme scores for the RTX 3000 GPUs and then divided by the price to get the performance per dollar comparison. You can see that the 3060, 3070, and 3080 offers the best value, while the over $1,000 GPUs gives you much less performance for your dollar. To understand why Nvidia created the 3090 at that price point in the first place, I would highly recommend you watch a recent video by Paul from Paul's Hardware. He has an excellent video on price anchoring, link in the description below. For those who don't know, price anchoring is a very effective means to increase prices. First, you create a new high price point in the 3090 at $1499, and a generation later, the price increase to $1599 now seems like a great deal. But everyone forgot about the fact that the $1499 price was made up in a sham and was only used to create a new higher ceiling for NVIDIA GPUs. It was a great way to manipulate people into thinking that paying $1,500 for a top-level gaming GPU is a good deal. It's actually quite masterful. I have to hand it to Jensen and his team for being able to manipulate people's thinking on what is a good deal on a high-end GPU. And when I say people, I also mean people in the tech media who cover these events. Well, except for Paul. Good job, Jensen, you masterful manipulator you. Getting back to the performance per dollar chart, remember when Jensen showed the RTX 3000 GPUs coexisting with the RTX 4000 GPUs? Using the data Jensen provided, I can estimate the Time Spy Extreme score for the 4090 to be at around 18,000 points, the 4080 to be around 14,000, and the 4080 Imposter around 10,000. Plotting the performance per dollar of the new cards and, oh, you can see that you get no generational performance upgrade with ADA. Zero. Not even with the 4090. In fact, it's slightly less than the 3000 series. The 4090 just climbs up to the performance per dollar levels of the 3070 and 3080. With ADA, you will get more performance, but you will have to pay for it. This generation, more performance equals more money. That is why I do not like this generation. It's not about the performance, it's about the price. We should get an improvement in performance every generation for a similar price as last gen, but not with ADA. It's actually a regression in performance per dollar. We are paying more for the performance in RTX 4000 than we did in RTX 3000. If you go back in history and look at the generational performance per dollar for the 80 series of GPUs back to the GTX 980, you can see that in every generation, you got more performance for your dollar. And the 3080 offered really good performance for your dollar. But not with the 4080. It's a regression. It's like a precursor for entering the dark ages. I'll explain more in my next video. Getting back to it, you can see that a worst case increase in die cost from TSMC would only explain a fraction of the cost increase that we are seeing from Jensen. Jensen cannot lay the blame on TSMC and just say, it's a ton more expensive. And as we saw last time, he can't blame it on Moore's Law either. So what is Jensen's master plan for not providing a generational increase in performance and getting people to pay more for all of that performance? Why is this Jensen's golden opportunity to raise GPU prices across the board? And does his master plan leave him exposed to his competitors in a way like we've never seen before? To find out, We'll cover that next time. Thank you all so very much for watching. Stay safe, and I will see you in the next one.